And so I wanted to put together a panel today to bring these various uh, opinions and perspectives um, to you all, because I know that you are all having these conversations about CBDs um, in patient forums, um, you're having them um, in smaller meetings, and so I'm, I'm hoping today that we can hear from these different perspectives and start looking at um, how this is going to affect our legislative work and how we're going to move forward. So I'm, I have to rush us through this. So each of our speakers, I know I told you you could have um, eight minutes. You actually now have five minutes. All right. Sorry. They're all going to be here um, for you to hang out with later. I'm sure if you buy them each a drink um, or something that they will, they will answer all your questions about CBDs. All right, so first I'm going to inter introduce um, Jehan Marku. He is uh, the Vice Chair of Americans for Safe Access um, uh, Medical Scientific Advisory Board. He is currently, um, is currently working with, with a lab out of, out of California, uh, now Nevada, sorry. Um, she moved, that's okay. Um, and has actually been working with Americans for Safe Access um, on, on uh, educational series. But most importantly, Jehan was one of the authors of the Cannabis Monograph. So, Jehan? Okay. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jehan Marku, and the title of my talk today is Myth and Mysteries of Cannabidiol. And first, as a disclaimer, I'd like to say that despite years of trying to cultivate lucrative conflicts of interest, none of them have panned out in any meaningful way. <laughs> so we're here today because of cannabidiol, at least at this panel. We're very interested in it. And I'd like to just start by saying there are two ways we can think about CBD. There's what we know through science and the recording of careful observation, and there's how we wish it could be. Uh, and I believe right now the future of this industry depends on many things, but also how well we understand cannabidiol and how well we apply that knowledge. Um, and so today, this is the outline of my quick talk. We're going to talk about some assumptions we make we all make, some are specific, some are general about cannabidiol. Uh, the main thing I want you to take home probably is this idea of psychoactivity, what it is and what it means. It really just means brain activity. So when you say something is non-psychoactive, you have to qualify that by saying it's non-psychoactive. Maybe it's non-psychoactive like THC. It has a unique psychoactive profile. It doesn't cause intoxication. You know, watch your language is my point. I'm going to talk about CBD and Schedule 1 lists. There's lots of different types of schedule lists out there. Um, I'm going to talk about what does CBD metabolize into. I just learned this a couple months ago, so I thought I'd share it with you. And I'm going to talk about CBD synergy, because I wish I could give the whole talk just about what the research is since the 1940s about combining THC and CBD, but I have four minutes. <laughs> so. So, recent trends and assumptions. CBD is non-psychoactive versus psychoactive. It goes into the brain. It has an effect. It interacts with serotonin receptors, just to give you an example. So, uh, be careful when you're thinking about this. So, when someone says we need to pass a CBD-only law because it's non-psychoactive, you know, my, my question is, I don't really know where to begin to correct that statement. Um, another thing that we often talk about is a strong, you know, we assume that there's a strong clinical basis for predominantly CBD products, when there really there isn't that much information about there. The opposite is true. We have way more information about high amounts of THC combined with low amounts of CBD or evil, equal mixtures. There's, not, there's virtually no information in humans except for maybe like 20 people over the last 30 years or so um, being looked at with just CBD products. Uh, and also another thing we assume is that huge doses of rare cannabinoids are always safe. We don't have a lot of information about what the long-term effects of cannabidiol are. We have way more information about the long-term effects of THC, I think. So these are legitimate concerns uh, that people have. And as well, another thing I just want to throw in there is that when you're deriving a new substance, creating a new botanically derived substance with solvents that haven't previously been used before, that requires some sort of, I don't know, characterization. Uh, all right, so uh, CBD according to the DEA. If you're going to write down one thing from this presentation, I'd write down CBD 7372. It's the DEA sort of schedule for it. 
Uh, that's probably the most important thing I have to talk about today. <laughs> so um, you can see that there's actually two references for marijuana with an H, one kind of six or seven from the top and one up from the bottom. So here's schedule one list. If you want to know where this comes from, it's the DEA drug diversion website. So when I was in academia, I worked with the two most heavily restricted things or regulated things, uh, cannabinoids and radiation. So uh, I know a lot about uh, trying to get your cannabinoids shipped to you, and so you'd go to the website, you fill out this form, indicate what you want, and, and your DEA license is it's established. Um, and so, you know, it, I wish it wasn't this way. I wish CBD was very much open for research and a lot of people had access to it. And this is a cover of the monograph, and this isn't just a shameless plug. I actually want to say that the picture on the front page of the monograph, I think, sums up perfectly where we are today. It's a crop of marijuana, cannabis sativa, surrounded by a 10-foot high barbed wire fence and a guard tower. That's where we are right now today. Maybe the second version will have a nice picture with a lovely outdoor greenhouse or something, but this is where we are today. And so this, and if you're in medical marijuana industry, which I assume most of you are, uh, whether you're a patient, a regulator, a provider, or just an enthusiast, you've caught some of the buzz about CBD. You've probably received maybe a few emails, spam, been contacted on social media groups, uh, maybe even heard some interesting testimonials about products and, and buying them. And I have, uh, you know, I've encountered this too, and I've posted those pictures I showed you before. Well, this is a DEA scheduled list. I'm not sure, you know, what you're saying about its legality is true or, or completely accurate in my situation. So um, I decided to share with you one of the, the arguments that I've seen most prevalent online. So um, this, I, I erased the name. So uh, I'm going to read the first sentence, and this is uh, when I posted the fact that... Uh, Cannabidiol is a Schedule I drug. This is a response I got from a guy. I am positive a multi-million dollar publicly traded company could not violate law in open air. The asterisk is to pause for laughter. <laughs> Have you been around this country? And then it goes on to talk about CBD being a wonderful antioxidant. This is true. The government did patent it. This is true as well. And then it goes on to talk about some other things. But um, I guess my point, you know, and this is not where it stops. So I did more research. And even on Wikipedia, uh, there is a change with reference to hemp meds and other companies. Instead of referencing the DEA website, it references like a blog or something like that. Uh, Schedule 1. Uh, basically, I thought this was really cute. Uh, this is what CBD has to say about itself. Schedule 1, comma, cannabidiol does not find itself on the list, which you know, is, is odd because depending on what list you cite, uh, it, could not be, it could not be on there for various reasons. And also, please do not feed the trolls online. That's a very important lesson. All right, so now I'm, I'm going to just talk about what I think is a really cool stuff, and that is what's CBD doing, just a kind of a quick sail through some of the research. Um, so something I think is really cool is CBD can inhibit the enzymes that synthesize and break down endocannabinoids. And that can allow THC to synergize with other endocannabinoids, so modulation, indirect interaction with the endocannabinoid system. Cannabidiol has its own unique anti-inflammatory processes. It doesn't necessarily act through CB1 or CB2 like THC does. It also can act as an allosteric modulator. It can prime a receptor for activation that is important for sort of the pain relief associated with when cannabis is consumed. And this is a quote from a paper by John McPartland. CBD is an antioxidant ROS scavenger. The U.S. Department of Health patented this discovery despite its classification of cannabis as a Schedule I substance having no currently accepted medical use. So a patent doesn't mean something is legal. You know, I could patent double bacon cheeseburgers for treating, you know, cardiovascular disease. It doesn't make, mean that those two things are actually kind of, you know, connected. Uh, so CBD also acts as a serotonin receptor. 
So CBD metabolism, I thought this was cool. Really the only thing to take home from this is uh, CBD-7-oic acid is what the main metabolite that CBD turns into. There's like 33 other ones. This comes from GW Pharmaceuticals uh, product description about Sativex. It's a really kind of fun read through about all the research about THC and CBD. Uh, I think it's interesting. So I, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm just about through. Okay, so um, real quick, THC and CBD, we all know, kind of are, might be familiar with some of these claims here, the studies, you see as so far back as 1974. Um, and we have more studies, and these are in human cells, human beings, or epidemiological studies. And these are all really saying that a certain ratio, right, either a one-to-one -one or low CBD, high THC works the best, um, and we see that in, like I said, human cancer cell lines, we see that in experiments on human tissue, and we see that in human beings being studied. And so basically, uh, CBD is listed on Schedule 1. I just want to be clear about that. There have been over 25 human and epidemiological studies on combining THC and CBD. These have always been on a low ratio of CBD to THC, like, you know, one part CBD, four parts THC or a one-to-one -one ratio, and there's really no studies that showed a greater than one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and that's just the 2.7 milligrams to 2.5 milligrams, that's the ratio of THC to CBD uh, that's in the technical description of Sativex. And my other point is, again, watch your language when you're talking <laughs> about these things, because, you know, terminology is really, really important. Um, so uh, thank you very much, and I'd be happy, like Steph said, to take any questions at the bar. <laughs> Thank you, Jehan. Um, I don't think he was kidding. He really wants each of you to buy him a drink. Um, so our next speaker we're going to hear from is um, Dean Patikas. Did I say that right? Patikas? Pekanis, sorry. Um, who is the chairman and chief executive officer for Canalife. Um, and he was, uh, Canalife is actually now under the umbrella of Hemp Men's. Is that correct? The merger just happened? I'll uh, let you no. tell him. Separate company. I'm sorry. I apologize. Well, I'll let you um, come up and tell us about um, about Canna Life and about um, uh, about the hemp meds products. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. Just have me. Uh, this is an interesting opportunity to shed some light on what really are myths and what are really truths and uh, where the marketplace should be focusing their attention with regards to naturopathic and uh, homeopathic and, of course, supplemental uh, regimens of healthcare. Uh, CBD is a naturally derived uh, compound from the cannabis taxa, and it's also synthetically produced, as are many of the cannabinoid structures that are found in the cannabis taxa plant. Uh, I've put together a quick list of myths uh, to discuss here today. Some of them are crossover with Dr. Mark, who gave an excellent presentation. Uh, and I uh, would say that in the, uh, in the opening, uh, we're working with hemp meds to help produce uh, greater visibility on the scientific side of cannabinoid-based uh, consumables. And we're happy to be able to do that. So myth number one, substantial evidence in man, animals, and cell cultures that CBD is neuroprotective. Well, our studies, as a result of our exclusive out license with National Institutes of Health on the 507 patent for a particular disease indication, have shown so far in preclinical that it indeed is neuroprotective. At the same time, we had to run baseline studies on synthetic cannabidiol-based con compounds to see what the baseline effects are against CBD, because there is going to be a broad range in, in our scientific body of opinion in terms of administration, dosage, bioavailability. And we d do know now that it is indeed a neuroprotective agent. On Dr. Marku's point with Dr. Hampson's paper, uh, as far as a raw scavenger is concerned, we looked at several plates and found that uh, that is going to be a very difficult target to assess in terms of reactive oxygen species. Myth number two, is CBD really safe or are there pharmacokinetic aspects distribution, storage, and duration of treatment that make the assessment and safety premature. And if there are observed adverse reactions to CBD, what are they? Again, Dr. Mark, who pointed out 
And point number three, that the, we don't have enough time with regards to dosage and administration to get a sense of what the long-range effects are. We do know that it is cumulative. It loves fatty tissue. It sits in your adipose where you have a tremendous amount of endocannabinoid receptor-based uh, elements in your body, in your liver, and in your brain. So long-term administration of cannabidiol like compounds can definitely accumulate and I would uh, certainly counsel clinicians to look at that in the path and pathology of the patient's admin administered medicine. Uh, number three, there's anecdotal evidence of anti-seizure actions for CBD. Now this is gonna be a hot topic because there are a lot of producers out there, what I call them new age pharmacists. They are producers in the marketplace. So many are very fine botanists that have crossed over into the field of creating what they deem as medicine. And it is not medicine, and they themselves should not then be going out to the marketplace pretending that they are treating patients. The demand is coming from parents, children who are in great need, and that need is being filled, and it's being filled on a pull-side demand, such as there's a parent that was here earlier that said, I want my kid to have the medicine that my kid needs. Now, I doubt that law enforcement in this country under the Holder letter, and Obama's administration's position on withdrawing from prosecuting in this instance is going to rankle the marketplace. But what is rankling the marketplace, I want to speak to this, is the overabundance of backbiting and fighting in the industry. So whoever is in this room is in a producer capacity. Raise your hand. You're, you're producers. Turn to your neighbors and tell them that their product sucks. Do it now because that's what you're going to do when you leave this room. And it happens consistently, and it's got to stop. Okay, it's got to stop. If this industry is going to get any foothold, and it's going to move forward, it needs solidarity. So what we need in this instance of anti-seizure medication is a real double-blind study, a multi-center evaluation of anti-seizure therapeutic action, and that is needed, particularly in the refractory area of epilepsy. I think that we could have a compassionate use model in the government and somebody, especially GW Pharmaceuticals and the fine work that they have done, especially the work of Dr. Jeffrey Guy, could certainly be a leader in producing something forth right now with the FDA. I believe they are. Um, I would say that uh, the, the consequences of the long range effects are really what have to be looked at right now. Uh, that would be good for the clinical model in use. So doctors can get their hands around it a little bit more. And the last myth I think I'd like to try and bust is what is the best route of administration for CBD? A woman here was earlier was speaking that her son cannot smoke. But there are multiple forms of administration with regards to cannabinoid therapy. And I would also counsel the producers in this room to start working with science in the field of extracts, in the field of extracting natural-based products, and looking at forms of administration that now the parents who are pulling this medicine into the market or out of the marketplace can feel comfortable to rally back with their doctors and check with clinical response. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next speaker we're going to hear from is Martin Lee. He's the director of Project CBD, um, which I think most of the people in this room know about that project. But really, when um, a few years ago, when patients were asking some of some of these questions, what is CBD? Where can we find it? Um, Martin Lee um, and Project CBD not only formed to help answer some of those questions, but also started seeking out high CBD strains. And Martin, thank you. Thanks, Steph. I got to be really quick, I guess. So uh, I will talk about some of the myths that we, we encounter. You know, it's, CBD is a hot ticket right now among medical scientists, health professionals, and the public is becoming aware. But along with that awareness is a lot of misinformation. First myth, CBD is medical, unlike THC. That's the recreational part. That's the first myth we encounter. We get a lot of queries from all over the world at Project CBD on a daily basis. Uh, where can I get a CBD? I just want CBD, not THC, only CBD. Well, only CBD doesn't exist in nature. Um, and uh, if you're looking, for, if, depending on what your condition is, if you're seeking out only CBD, it might not be very effective. In fact, even for the children with catastrophic seizure disorders, which is the CBD, uh, CBD dominant remedies have proven so miraculous, it doesn't always work. Um, in fact, we, we have examples of uh, parents who try it, 
It might be a Charlotte's Web or some other strain. It's not working, they increase the dose. It's not working, they increase the dose again. Not working, they think they have to increase the dose again. It seems they're on the wrong path here. Maybe if they added a little THC into the mix, it might be better. CBD, uh, I should say cannabis, is a dialectical plant. It has compounds uh, in it that have opposite effects and yet also synergistic effects. Example, THC, the high causer, our beloved psychoactive compound. Um, it has certain effects that CBD can actually neutralize depending on how much CBD and THC is in a given strain or, or, or remedy. Uh, the CBD might actually neutralize, completely eliminate the psychoactive effects of the THC. And yet at the same time, the, uh, the CBD can enhance THC's pain-killing effects, its anti-tumoral effects, and so on. So opposing yet synergistic, that's dialectical. That doesn't necessarily fit in with the typical allopathic medical model. But what else do we hear? What other kind of questions do we get? Uh, we often are asked, well, do you have Charlotte's Web? Can you tell us where you can get Charlotte's Web? Uh, and I say, well, it's in Colorado. I know it's being grown by affiliates in, in California. I don't know how you can get that other than sign up with Realm of Caring and go through that process. Good luck. It's, it's proven to be very, very effective in many cases. It's tremendous. Um, but it doesn't always work. And sometimes we get people saying, well, I want some, and I, and I inform people when I'm asked that question, but by the way, there are several strains that are very similar in terms of the CBD THC ratio, this CBD dominant ratio with very little THC, typically just the opposite of what we find in most dispensaries for, for uh, the medicine there. Um, but uh, again, there's sort of misconceptions about this. Well, it has to be exactly the same ratio. It's got to be 30 to 1 or whatever they're claiming it is. The problem is that labs that, that uh, remember, uh, the labs that analyze these strains, you know, they're accurate but not absolutely precise. They can't be. So if you're measuring something that's, and you get a 0.2% THC, another lab or maybe the same lab can measure the same thing and get 0.4%. Well, you've just, you know, you just changed the ratio from 30 to 1 to 15 to 1. So this idea of you have to have the biggest number, this is my CBD is bigger than your CBD. This is another myth, you know, <laughs> that, that, uh, that people, but we confront this a lot, you know. Um, I, I was just in Uruguay, just to shift gears slightly here, and, and I, I was meeting with doctors and, and uh, human rights activists. Incidentally, in, in Uruguay, they consider cannabis access a human rights issue. Um, but I was a often asked by the doctors I was meeting with, uh, they would ask me, well, what's the ra best ratio for this condition of CBD and THC? And I'd first say, well, I'm not a doctor, and I can't really tell you these, and you know, give you answers to these questions. I can give you sort of a generic uh, feedback uh, on the basis of what we're hearing at CBD from doctors and from scientists. And we, we can make general comments. Yes, it's clear that in, in the cases of, of Dravet syndrome and these other uh, epileptic disorders, a CBD dominant remedy will often be effective. Not always, but very often, it turns out. Uh, for something like anxiety, if that's your issue, more than likely, a CBD dominant, issue, uh, dominant ratio, little THC, small doses, will be effective. That's, again, what we're hearing. But if you're dealing with pain or cancer, mm, that's a too narrow uh, a, 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 an option. You need a broader range of ratios, a broader range of medicines to choose from. Um, there's been a lot of work with Sativex, you know, the GW Pharmaceuticals, uh, the clinical trials actually, not just preclinical animal studies, that, that have demonstrated clearly that for pain and spasticity and multiple sclerosis and other neuropathic uh, pain issues, uh, that a more even ratio of THC and CBD is more effective. Uh, for cancers, I'd say more likely the same. And yet we're getting you know, uh, queries from people, I have cancer, my wife is this, uh, and where do we get the, 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 the CBD only remedy or something without THC? And I, I say, well, you know, good luck, but from what we're hearing on the basis of, of uh, the information we have, that might not be the most effective approach. You know, there's many other myths we can kind of rattle off here. Let's see, I have one more minute. Um, you know, potency, how much to use. And how do you, how do you um, that's the other question, not just the ratio, but how much you actually take of the medicine. Um, well, you know, I've heard some people uh, who, who are advocates calculating dosages on the basis of animal studies. I'll give you just a quick example in terms of um, uh, uh, the juicing cannabis. Uh, it was based on a study that showed a 20, uh, uh, 20 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, of a CBD was effective in an animal study, pure CBD, not whole plant CBD. And yet this was used to transpose a, 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 a potency for a different compound, CBD acid, which is different from CBD, 
uh, the a CBD in its raw form, unheated form, uh, of a whole plant um, for a human. Three different factors here at play. And as a result, we end up being told that these enormous doses are necessary because it was tw uh, the 20 milligrams per kilogram. And I'm not sure if that is the case. I do know that uh, uh, the raw cannabinoids can be very effective medicinally, and, and we're get, getting information now how for the children with epilepsy, sometimes THCA, the raw version of THC, the unheated version, can be very effective. But again, then, now this is getting transposed. Well, this can be just a substitute for CBD. You don't need CBD. All you need is THCA. I wouldn't go that far, particularly for many other conditions. Much less is known about these acid cannabinoids than uh, the actual, uh, the, as we call them, the neutral cannabinoids, the heated cannabinoids. I could go on and on, and, and um, I wish I had more time, but I think in, one more, uh, one more minute, okay. One more, one more, one minute. more minute, let's see what do we want to do. <laughs> well, when we launched Project CBD, we being Fred Gardner, editor of O'Shaughnessy and I, four years ago, you know, we had this idea that, uh, we, we, we made the assumption that once we discovered these CBD-rich strains, the, 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 the first few came into our possession, um, that this could be very significant because we had been attending science conferences for several years in which they were discussing the preclinical, the animal studies, the preclinical work with uh, usually, uh, well, sometimes whole plant CBD, more often than not, synthetic CBD. But the, the revelations that we were hearing at these science conferences were so astonishing in terms of the broad range of conditions that CBD could potentially uh, be applicable for that once we actually rediscovered that the CBD was available on the grassroots, we, the first question was, well, I, what will this mean? What will happen if this gets out here? Will it be anything like the preclinical studies? And I think, in fact, it is. It's even more amazing in some ways. When you, when you see the children with epilepsy respond to this, I mean, how can it not? It's, a, it's just astonishing. It, it, it's, you know, it's better than any science paper could, could ever imply. Um, but I think uh, we also had another, another assumption was that we felt that CBD, and I'm not being that, I mean CBD rich cannabis, that's a phrase we coined. We didn't want to say high CBD, so we said CBD rich. Uh, could be the nail in the coffin for pro pro prohibition, because what, would the, what could the drug warriors say about this? I mean, it's safe, it's, 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 it could be non psychoactive, at least not like a THC is psychoactive. What would be the response? Um, but what we never anticipated, was that uh, the, uh, this would be used uh, to actually limit the legalization, as we're seeing with the CBD-only bills, as they're called, in several states. Now, I have a very mixed feeling about this. On the one hand, anything that can help someone who's desperately ill, and if that means the CBD-only legislation, how can you be against it? On the one hand. On the other hand, this will only address a very narrow range of needs in the patient population. So we don't go and advocate for it. We advocate for full legalization. Um, the other thing I didn't expect when we launched the, the uh, uh, Project CBD, this will be my last point, we never expected this would become the focus of these multi-level marketing campaigns, these pyramid schemes. Can away is the one we're hearing about now. I'm sure you've been hit with this stuff. I mean, never in my wildest thought. I, I think, <laughs> and there's a lot one could say about that, and that's controversial. It's controversial within our community. Um, and uh, I wish I had more time to address the controversy, but I think in the interest, I should turn it over to Eric. Anyway, thank you. No, I think um, as a medical cannabis patient, um, it is pretty confusing what you hear every day, right? And I, I, I think a lot of, for the patient community, most of us learned about THC acids, CBD acids in the last couple of years. And so, um, but we're also dealing with populations of people that are desperate, um, that are looking for, for any answer. And as a patient advocate, um, it's hard to sift through that information, right? On one hand, um, if we're seeing any relief whatsoever in a condition, that's, it, that's exciting. Um, on the other hand, we hear a lot of stories about something working for a minute for a patient and then not working ever again or not finding that, that, uh, um, finding that medication again. Um, but we also, our medicine isn't covered by health insurance. And so I just want to say thank all of you for starting this dialogue. And obviously we're not going to get to the bottom of all of the myths and facts about CBD today. Um, but I hope that, that we can really continue this dialogue. And Eric um, is going to bring a, a, a unique perspective. He's the executive director um, of Hemp Industries Association. Um, that's also, hemp oils have now been brought into this discussion as well. So Eric. Thank you.
Yeah. I would just uh, maybe give a little bit of background on the HIA since uh, most of you are working in medical cannabis here. So the HIA, uh, Hemp Industries Association, is a trade association was founded in the, uh, 1994 by members of the hemp industry, mostly working with industrial hemp, things like clothing and, and uh, other goods made out of the stalk and the seed from the hemp plant. And um, it represents uh, manufacturers, farmers, researchers, and consumers who have been involved in the association. So we've been doing this for about 20 years. Most of you probably know hemp maybe as the um, swag or the non-drug variety of cannabis that you really can't get high from. Um, the DEA actually has an official term for this. When they seize marijuana and they find it wild in a farmer's field, for example, they call it ditchweed in their reports. And uh, so that's kind of a good indication of, uh, you know, a little bit more background on, on what hemp is in terms of the cannabinoid content. Um, hemp is generally cannabis with less than 1% THC and uh, typically has a ratio of greater than one of CBD to THC. So it's a little higher in, in uh, CBD. By regulation, uh, actually we were very fortunate this year to get a, a, a new uh, bill or a new law passed into the farm bill that actually gives us a definition for industrial hemp and for the first time now, hemp actually is distinct from marijuana under federal law. That definition as well as a number of other state definitions is a three tenths of 1% THC or less. Um, and there's nothing that says anything about THC or CBD in there rather but uh, typical hemp varieties that you see grown in Canada and other places around the world typically have maybe say two tenths of a percent THC and they might have a half a percent or six or six tenths of a percent CBD. So it'll be higher in CBD but typically hemp strains of cannabis do not have a high amount of resin. They don't have a really high content of cannabinoids in general. Um, so the HIs work to expand markets for hemp and for and also to protect against unreasonable regulations. And one of the things that happened in, in 2000, the DEA uh, actually issued a, a couple of administrative rules where they attempted to ban hemp foods or any product actually that contained any amount of THC. And they didn't really define that, they just used the word any. And the hemp industry uh, was very concerned about this. All the, uh, products that are out on the market, if you look at them, you might be able to find, say, a few parts per million of THC in, let's say, a hemp seed oil. And so there was the potential that those products could be completely removed from the shelves. And these are nutritious, healthy products. And uh, we didn't want to see that happen. So we uh, ended up going to the, court, to court, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And uh, we were successful in getting an injunction in 2001 and then ultimately got a decision in 2004, and that final decision, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said that uh, products that were made from hemp, uh, hemp seed, uh, that contained uh, trace amounts of THC would not be banned by the DEA, and they overturned that rule. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, typically the cannabinoids in hemp are, are, you know, are quite low in general. Um, also, cannabinoids are primarily found in the leaves and the flowers of the plant, and there was actually a study done by, uh, um, uh, it was published in the Journal of Analytical Toxicology talking about the amount of THC that might be in hemp products and how it related to drug testing. In any case, they noted specifically that THC and other cannabinoids are only present in hemp products or hemp seed, for example, or oil as a result of sort of the contamination. The seed itself does not contain THC, but the, the, the fact that the seeds are produced in the, in the flowers of the plant it can get uh, THC or other cannabinoids on the shell of the uh, seeds. So in the pressing process, you might get some small quantities of those cannabinoids in the, in the finished product. Industries actually established a standard on this because there was concerns about drug testing and the potential that somebody might consume a hemp product and then fail a drug test. And we didn't want to see that happen. And so there was all, another uh, study that was published in Journal of Analytical Toxicology that established standards the industry has voluntarily uh, adopted those standards. And so products today, if you, you, know, you can eat as much hemp seed or hemp seed oil or whatever as you want, and you're not going to fail a drug test from that. And uh, so some of the products more recently that have come out with CBD have been also using the term hemp oil. And so there's, and, and there may be some, perhaps some blended products, but there's a need for some clarity so that consumers and people that are looking for these products 
uh, we'll know what the difference is. If you're just looking for a nutritional product that has, you know, that's, that's a hemp oil and has the nutritional aspects of that, you should be able to tell what the difference is between that and a product that's specifically being marketed for the CBD content. So we just, uh, we've been working with uh, APA and, uh, and I know there's a cannabis committee that's actually been meeting and discussing this issue and we're hoping that we can come up with a resolution and uh, just that's, that's one of the uh, things I think that uh, we're, we're hoping to resolve. So in any case, I've got, my time is up here, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue this discussion. I'll be happy to talk to anybody after the pr presentation. Thank you.